Story eight of The Man Without a Country and Other Tales by Edward Everett Hale. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Story eight My Double and How He Undid Me. One of the Ingham Papers. Part one. A Boston journal, in noticing this story, called it improbable. I think it is, but I think the moral important. It was first published in the Atlantic Monthly for September, 1859. It is not often that I trouble the readers of the Atlantic Monthly. I should not trouble them now, but for the importunities of my wife, who feels to insist that a duty to society is unfulfilled till I have told why I had to have a double, and how he undid me. She is sure, she says, that intelligent persons cannot understand that pressure upon public servants which alone drives any man into the employment of a double. And while I fear she thinks, at the bottom of her heart, that my fortunes will never be remade, she has a faint hope that, as another Rasselas, I may teach a lesson to future publics, from which they may profit, though we die owing to the behaviour of my double, or, if you please, to that public pressure which compelled me to employ him, I have plenty of leisure to write this communication. I am, or rather was, a minister of the Sandemanian connection. I was settled in the active, wide-awake town of Nguaudovic, on one of the finest water-powers in Maine. We used to call it a western town in the heart of the civilization of New England. A charming place it was, and is. A spirited, brave young parish had I, and it seemed as if we might have all the joy of eventful living to our heart's content. Alas, how little we knew on the day of my ordination and in those halcyon moments of our first housekeeping! to be the confidential friend in a hundred families in the town, cutting the social trifle, as my friend Halliburton says, from the top of the whipped syllabub to the bottom of the sponge-cake, which is the foundation, to keep abreast of the thought of the age in one's study, and to do one's best on Sunday to interweave that thought with the active life of an active town and to inspirit both, and make both infinite by glimpses of the eternal glory, seemed such an exquisite forelook into one's life. Enough to do, and all so real and so grand, if this vision could only have lasted. The truth is that this vision was not in itself a delusion, nor indeed half bright enough. If one could only have been left to do his own business, the vision would have accomplished itself and brought out new paraheliacal visions, each as bright as the original. The misery was, and is, as we found out, I and Polly, before long, that besides the vision, and besides the usual human and finite failures in life, such as breaking the old pitcher that came over in the Mayflower, and putting into the fire the alpenstock with which her father climbed Mont Blanc. Besides these, I say, imitating the style of Robinson Crusoe, there were pitchforked in on us a great rowan heap of humbugs, handed down from some unknown seed times, in which we were expected, and I chiefly, to fulfil certain public functions before the community, of the character of those fulfilled by the third row of supernumeraries, who stand behind the sepoys in the spectacle of the cataract of the Ganges. They were the duties, in a word, which one performs as a member of one or another social class or subdivision, wholly distinct from what one does as a by himself a what invisible power put these functions on me it would be very hard to tell but such power there was and is and i had not been at work a year before i found i was living two lives one real and one merely functional for two sets of people one my parish whom i loved and the other a vague public for whom i did not care two straws all this was in a vague notion which everybody had and has 
that the second life would eventually bring out some great results, unknown at present, to somebody somewhere. Crazed by this duality of life, I first read Dr. Wigan on The Duality of the Brain, hoping that I could train one side of my head to do these outside jobs, and the other to do my intimate and real duties. For Richard Greenow once told me that, in studying for the statue of Franklin, he found that the left side of the great statesman's face was philosophic and reflective, and the right side funny and smiling. If you will go and look at the bronze statue, you will find he has repeated this observation there for posterity. The eastern profile is the portrait of the statesman Franklin, the western of poor Richard. But Dr. Wigan does not go into these niceties of this subject, and I failed. It was then that, on my wife's suggestion, I resolved to look out for a double. I was at first singularly successful. We happened to be recreating at Stafford Springs that summer. We rode out one day, for one of the relaxations of that watering place, to the great Monson poorhouse. We were passing through one of the large halls, when my destiny was fulfilled. He was not shaven, he had on no spectacles, he was dressed in a green baize roundabout and faded blue overalls, worn sadly at the knee. But I saw at once that he was of my height, five feet four and a half. He had black hair, worn off by his hat. So have and have not I. He stooped in walking, so do I. His hands were large, and mine, and choicest gift of fate in all, he had not a strawberry mark on his left arm, but a cut from a juvenile brick-bat over his right eye, slightly affecting the play of that eyebrow. Reader, so have I. My fate was sealed. A word with Mr. Hawley, one of the inspectors, settled the whole thing. It proved that this Dennis Shea was a harmless, amiable fellow, of the class known as Shiftless, who had sealed his fate by marrying a dumb wife, who was at that moment ironing in the laundry. Before I left Stafford I had hired both for five years. We had applied to Judge Pynchon, then the probate judge at Springfield, to change the name of Dennis Shea to Frederick Ingham. We had explained to the judge what was the precise truth that an eccentric gentleman wished to adopt Dennis, under this new name, into his family. It never occurred to him that Dennis might be more than fourteen years old, and thus, to shorten this preface, when we returned at night to my parsonage at Nagwaudovic, there appeared Mrs. Ingham, her new dumb laundress, myself, who am Mr. Frederick Ingham, and my double, who was Mr. Frederick Ingham, by as good a right as I. Oh, the fun we had the next morning in shaving his beard to my pattern, cutting his hair to match mine, and teaching him how to wear and how to take off gold-bowed spectacles. Really they were electroplate, and the glass was plain, for the poor fellow's eyes were excellent. Then, in four successive afternoons, I taught him four speeches. I had found these would be quite enough for the supernumerary sepoy line of life, and it was well for me they were, for though he was good-natured, he was very shiftless, and it was, as our national proverb says, like pulling teeth to teach him. But at the end of the next week he could say, with quite my easy and frisky air, one, very well, thank you, and you? This for an answer to casual salutations. Two, I am very glad you liked it. Three, there has been so much said, and on the whole so well said, that I will not occupy the time. Four, I agree in general with my friend the other side of the room. At first I had a feeling that I was going to be at great cost for clothing him, but it proved, of course, at once that whenever he was out I should be at home, and I went, during the bright period of his success, 
to so few of those awful pageants which require a black dress coat and what the ungodly call after mr dickens a white choker that in the happy retreat of my own dressing-gowns and jackets my days went by as happily and cheaply as those of another thalaba and polly declares there was never a year when the tailoring cost so little he lived dennis not thalaba in his wife's room over the kitchen he had orders never to show himself at that window when he appeared in the front of the house i retired to my sanctissimum and my dressing-gown in short the dutchman and his wife in the old weather-box had not less to do with each other than he and i he made the furnace fire and split the wood before daylight then he went to sleep again and slept late then came for orders with a red silk bandana tied round his head with his overalls on and his dress coat and spectacles off if we happened to be interrupted no one guessed that he was frederick ingham as well as i and in the neighbourhood there grew up an impression that the minister's irishman worked daytimes in the factory village at new coventry after i had given him his orders i never saw him till the next day i launched him by sending him to a meeting of the enlightenment board the enlightenment board consists of seventy-four members of whom sixty-seven are necessary to form a quorum one becomes a member under the regulations laid down in old judge dudley's will i became one by being ordained pastor of a church in the guadovic you see you cannot help yourself if you would at this particular time we had four successive meetings averaging four hours each wholly occupied in whipping in a quorum at the first only eleven men were present at the next by force of three circulars twenty-seven at the third thanks to two days canvassing by achmati and myself begging men to come we had sixty half the others were in europe but without a quorum we could do nothing. All the rest of us waited grimly for our four hours, and adjourned without any action. At the fourth meeting we had flagged and only got fifty-nine together, but on the first appearance of my double, whom I sent on this fatal Monday to the fifth meeting, he was the sixty-seventh man who entered the room. He was greeted with a storm of applause the poor fellow had missed his way read the street signs ill through his spectacles very ill in fact without them and had not dared to inquire he entered the room finding the president and secretary holding to their chairs two judges of the supreme court who were also members ex officio and were begging leave to go away on his entrance all was changed presto the bylaws were suspended and the western property was given away nobody stopped to converse with him he voted as i had charged him to do in every instance with the minority i won new laurels as a man of sense though a little unpunctual and dennis alias ingham returned to the parsonage astonished to see with how little wisdom the world is governed he cut a few of my parishioners in the street, but he had his glasses off, and I am known to be near-sighted. Eventually he recognized them more readily than I. I set him again at the exhibition of the New Coventry Academy, and here he undertook a speaking part, as in my boyish worldly days I remember the bills used to say of Mademoiselle Celeste. We are all trustees of the New Coventry Academy, and there has lately been a good deal of feeling because the sandemanian trustee did not regularly attend the exhibitions it has been intimated indeed that the sandemanians are leaning towards free will and that we have therefore neglected these semi-annual exhibitions while there is no doubt that achmati last year went to commencement at waterville now the headmaster at new coventry is a real good fellow who knows a sanskrit root when he sees it and often cracks etymologies with me 
so that in strictness I ought to go to their exhibitions. But think, reader, of sitting through three long July days in the Academy Chapel, following the program from Tuesday morning, English composition, sunshine, Miss Jones, round to trio in three pianos, duel from the opera of Midshipman Easy, Mariat, coming in at nine Thursday evening. Think of this, reader, for men who know the world is trying to go backward, and who would give their lives if they could help it on. Well, the double had succeeded so well at the board that I sent him to the academy. Shade of Plato, pardon! He arrived early on Tuesday, when, indeed, few but mothers and clergymen are generally expected, and returned in the evening to us, covered with honours. He had dined at the right hand of the chairman, and he spoke in high terms of the repast. The chairman had expressed his interest in the French conversation. "'I am very glad you liked it,' said Dennis, and the poor chairman, abashed, supposed the accent had been wrong. At the end of the day, the gentleman present had been called upon for speeches, the Reverend Frederick Ingham first, as it happened, upon which Dennis had risen and had said, There has been so much said, and on the whole so well said, that I will not occupy the time. The girls were delighted, because Dr. Dabney, the year before, had given them at this occasion a scolding on impropriety of behavior at Lyceum lectures. They all declared Mr. Ingham was a love, and so handsome. Dennis is good-looking. Three of them, with arms behind the other's waists, followed him up to the wagon he rode home in, and a little girl with a blue sash had been sent to give him a rosebud. After this debut in speaking, he went to the exhibition for two days more, to the mutual satisfaction of all concerned. Indeed, Polly reported that he had pronounced the trustees' dinners of a higher grade than those of the parsonage. When the next term began, I found six of the Academy girls had obtained permission to come across the river and attend our church, but this arrangement did not long continue. After this he went to several commencements for me, and ate the dinners provided. He sat through three of our quarterly conventions for me, always voting judiciously by the simple rule mentioned above of siding with the minority. And I, meanwhile, who had before been losing caste among my friends, as holding myself aloof from the associations of the body, began to rise in everybody's favour. Ingham's a good fellow, always on hand. Never talks much, but does the right thing at the right time. Is not as unpunctual as he used to be. He comes early, and sits through to the end. He has got over his old talkative habit, too. I spoke to a friend of his about it once, and I think Ingham took it kindly, and so forth and so forth. This voting power of Dennis was particularly valuable at the quarterly meetings of the proprietors of the Naguadovic Ferry. My wife inherited from her father some shares in that enterprise, which is not yet fully developed, though it doubtless will become a very valuable property. The law of Maine then forbade stockholders to appear by proxy at such meetings. Polly disliked to go, not being, in fact, a hen's rights hen, transferred her stock to me. I, after going once, disliked it more than she. But Dennis went to the next meeting, and liked it very much. He said the armchairs were good, the collation good, and the free rides to the stockholders pleasant. He was a little frightened when they first took him upon one of the ferry-boats, but after two or three quarterly meetings he became quite brave. Thus far I never had any difficulty with him. Indeed, being, as I implied, of that type which is called shiftless, he was only too happy to be told daily what to do, and to be charged not to be forth-putting, or in any way original in his discharge of that duty. He learned, however, to discriminate between the lines of his life, 
and very much preferred these stockholders' meetings and trustees' dinners and commencement collations to another set of occasions, from which he used to beg off most piteously. Our excellent brother, Dr. Fillmore, had taken a notion at this time that our Sandemanian churches needed more expression of mutual sympathy. He insisted upon it that we were remiss. He said that if the bishop came to preach at Naguadovic, all the Episcopal clergy of the neighborhood were present. If Dr. Pond came, all the Congregational clergymen turned out to hear him. If Dr. Nichols, all the Unitarians and he thought we owed it to each other, that whenever there was an occasional service at a Sandemanian church, the other brethren should all, if possible, attend. It looked well, if nothing more. Now this really meant that I had not been to hear one of Dr. Fillmore's lectures on the ethnology of religion. He forgot that he did not hear one of my course on the Sandemanianism of Anselm but I felt badly when he said it, and afterwards I always made Dennis go to hear all the brethren preach when I was not preaching myself. This was what he took exceptions to, the only thing, as I said, which he ever did except to. Now came the advantage of his long morning nap, and of the green tea with which Polly supplied the kitchen. But he would plead, so humbly to be let off, only from one or two. I never accepted him, however. I knew the lectures were of value, and I thought it best he should be able to keep the connection. Polly is more rash than I am, as the reader has observed in the outset of this memoir. She risked Dennis one night under the eyes of her own sex. Governor Gorgeous had always been very kind to us, and when he gave his great annual party to the town, asked us. I confess I hated to go. I was deep in the new volume of Pfeiffer's Mystics, which Halliburton had just sent me from Boston. But how rude, said Polly, not to return the Governor's civility and Mrs. Gorgeous's, when they will be sure to ask why you are away. Still I demurred, and at last she, with the wit of Eve and of Semiramis conjoined, let me off by saying that if I would go in with her and sustain the initial conversations with the governor and the ladies staying there, she would risk Dennis for the rest of the evening. And that was just what we did. She took Dennis in training all that afternoon, instructed him in fashionable conversation, cautioned him against the temptations of the supper-table, and at nine in the evening he drove us all down in the carryall. I made the grand star entree with Polly and the pretty Walton girls who were staying with us. We had put Dennis into a great rough top-coat without his glasses, and the girls never dreamed, in the darkness, of looking at him. He sat in the carriage, at the door, while we entered. I did the agreeable to Mrs. Gorgeous, was introduced to her niece, Miss Fernanda. I complimented Judge Jeffreys on his decision in the great case of Dalney v. Laconia Mining Company. I stepped into the dressing-room for a moment, stepped out for another, walked home after a nod with Dennis, and tying the horse to a pump, and while I walked home, Mr. Frederick Ingham, my double, stepped in through the library into the Gorgeous's grand saloon. End of Story 8 Part 1